Okay, next uh, we're lucky enough to have um, the great Mr Tony Lay present to us. Tony's a, a AMS pharmacist at Westmead, Ch Westmead Children's Hospital. So today um, um, I'll give a, a nice picture of what um, paediatric health looks like at the kids' hospital and including how the AMS service fits in there. And I'll also be talking about challenging patient cases within the paediatric population and I kind of wish that I was after Mark and before John because I felt like some of my thunder has been stolen but we actually share quite similar challenges so I think as adult clinicians you might um, pick something up from my approach and management of these challenges and we have some take-home messages so this is purely from an AMS pharmacist point of view so Westmead Children's is a nice uh, 30k bike ride from here um, it's a, quite a comprehensive service and we give liver, renal transplants, full onc, BMT, cardiac neurosurge, burns, uh, a very big CF clinic, NICU and PICU. So our HIST service um, is run by a, a Gen Peds fellow, has nine nurses, physio and one day a week of dietitian and um, social worker. There is a 0.2 FTE of a pharmacist, but that's absorbed into the pharm pharmacy department because it's really hard to employ someone as a 0.2 FTE. And much to my uh, ID department's disappointment, there is no ID resources. So um, what about the AMS service at Kids and HIF? So I've broken it down to a pre-prescription and post-prescription prescription phases. So um, <clears throat> with the pre-prescription of a HIF antibiotic, our respiratory team and GEDMEN teams prescribe HIF antibiotics that are AMS approved. Um, so the, these are our guidelines for pneumonia, cellulitis, UTIs, fever, particular rash for meningococcal disease, CF and non-CF tune-ups. And all others, um, they come through an ID consult and um, all via our AMS approved, which is seldom used now. Um, but we do get those naughty uh, residents who think you can game the system, go straight to pharmacy and order their HIF antibiotics. But I've got good pharmacists in there and say, hey, Tony, we've got someone here ordering HIF antibiotics. Can you talk to them? And they come back to me. So, um, and then I usually hassle my ID fellows in the audience. Um, so, um, yeah, these get ordered by pharmacy, get it sent home. And what's unique at our um, hospital is that we've got an acute review clinic where... Um, Patients come back um, 48 to 24 hours and get seen by that Gen Peds fellow and um, they get assessed by the patient and then the, uh, the antibiotics are reviewed. So the beauty with um, our um, AMS service is that we have electronic prescribing and full EMM. So I get to see what's prescribed in the HIS service every day. And I get to follow them up and see whether or not the uh, durations are prolonged or whether or not they need AMS intervention. So um, what you can measure, you can manage. And uh, I've looked at the, um, the days of therapy of antibiotics for the last year. So unfortunately, in, in PEDS, we can't use um, you know, uh, DDDs, daily defined doses. So um, from the last year, we had uh, around 700 HIF antibiotics. It works out to be about 14 a week. Um, about 680 patients. We've gone um, to the youngest uh, kid we've treated is up to three, day, three day, from three days all the way up to 17 years, with the average being about five months. And looking at the raw total days of therapy, so this is from our EMM data, we, one can see that keftriaxone is the bulk of our use. It's our workhorse drug. And then we've got our CF tune-up drugs, um, our uh, pneumococcal uh, infections, and um, this cofoxidin and amicacin is just from one patient last year who had mycobacterium abscesses. So this is all well and good looking at um, the raw data, but what is more important is looking at the average days of therapy. And as an AMS steward, it makes me really happy to see that keftriaxin is only given on average two to three days. That's because they come back to the ARC clinic. Um, they, they get uh, the men meningococcal PCRs negative, CSFs clear. They either switch to orals or they get ceased. Um, now, looking at uh, the, the TOBRA is always using with in combination with Keftaz or PIPTAS, but uh, we didn't try to manage our, our PIPTAS shortage last year. So 
<coughs> it's not number one on our list of top 10 antibiotics based on dots. Uh, this is our um, pneumococcal infections. Uh, pneumococcal meningitis needs 21 days of treatment, complicated MR, uh, MSSA infections, um, and that one patient with mycobacterium abscessus. <coughs> so um, I think one of the best ways of learning is going through patient cases. So we've got this two-year-old CF patient with a chest tumour, or, or otherwise known as an infective exacerbation of CF, um, during the Tazazin shortage. So um, they were up to, they need 11 days of, of Keftaz and Toba in combination. And we can see that it's a fully susceptible sued. So then we get a letter from Baxter of the reduced shelf life, which has already been discussed, uh, with the, the, um, the shelf life reduced to six days and six hours at room temperature. Um, this is what they described as because they've started testing for impurities and stability. Uh, previously, they just were testing for stability. And um, as previously discussed by the other speakers, is the impurity they found was this toxic byproduct pyridine. So um, it's used as antifreeze, um, put in paints in resins. It's known as a hazardous compound with a CNS depressant type of toxicity and nausea vomiting. But then the IV root profile has not really been studied, but who really studies the toxicity of this type of drug and will get it published? Um, now, this French paper, which was um, mentioned by both our previous speakers, um, looked at the, the stability of an LV10, and all the pharmacists in the room will know that that's a, that's a 240 mil Baxter infuser given at 10 mils per hour at three temperatures, and the conclusions of that study were to give it as 12 hourly infusions and to use it immediately after reconstitution. But in trying to uh, apply this paper to my patients, they use much higher doses, 12 grams a day, I don't even think adults get 12 grams a day, um, and much higher concentrations. And as we should all know, the fundamental rate law of physical chemistry, the rate of reaction is directly proportional to the concentration of the reactant, the temperature, and the use of a catalyst. So looking at my particular patients, of 38 patients that got keftazamine infusers, we're getting a third of that dose, or as low as 2 to 5 milligrams per day, and up to 6 grams a day, and more, much more dilute concentrations. Um, so uh, this French paper uh, was uh, excellent at describing this linear production of pyridine based on their really high dose, highly concentrated um, infuser. And, um, and um, at, at the three temperatures, and you can see a really nice linear relationship. So how can I apply this to, to my patients? Um, so, as mentioned previously, the Europeans um, have a, a daily limit of two megs per day. But then if you look at um, concentration limits, uh, quite similar to, to the contentious thing about um, the 90% rule of shelf life, we're getting much different limits depending on which um, country you follow. So it could be seven megs per meal, 1.1 1 1 .1 meg per meal of pyridine um, as a limit. So at, a, at the kids' hospital, we, we use... Um, we use them for six days, we order six days worth. So I wanted to see, um, based on that linear relationship, after five days in the fridge, uh, what was its, its starting concentration of pyridine, and then you would give that last dose, you were hooking up that last sixth dose. And, and one can see that they're st still below the American and British pharmac pharmacopoeia limits, but still, um, if you times that by 240 or times it by 120, depending on the type of bag you use, it's above the daily limit set by Europeans. So we did a risk assessment and met with the head of respiratory, our HIP nurse, one of the toxicologists. We noticed the limitations, um, the lack of literature around pyridine toxicity, especially the IV route in humans. There were jurisdictional limits uh, in, um, for the pyridine. Um, and um, for our patients, we're using much lower doses, di more dilute concentrations, and more dilute than the, the concentration that the, the Baxter did their stability study on. And our CF patients are the most extensively followed up patients in our hospital. These patients are diagnosed at infancy and followed up by the same, te uh, same team until 18 years, of old, 18 years of age. So really, if we notice any period in toxicity, someone would have noticed it by now. Um, and we've been doing this for over 10 years, um, and we haven't had any treatment failures. 
So the outcome of our discussion was to fill in a Form C and to continue current practice. We could look into 12 hourly infusers and ice packs. And um, now that PIPTAS is coming back, we, we should push for alternatives. But one should um, be mindful of the implications of changing a very, well, uh, very commonly used drug for HIF, changing from daily to BD. And if you look at our DOTS data, at 274 dots of um, keptazidim in a year, with an extra two hours of work, you're looking at another 14 FTEs of RNs just to meet that need. So what is a Form C? Um, uh, it was mentioned before, but it's, it's a five-year declaration that, that uh, we assign a specific concentration and stability of a product, and that means that in case we get sued, it's all our fault. Um, so... So I, I fill these out quite often. Um, so we've got one for, um, for, for meropenem and, and keftazidine. So our next patient here, um, um, we had an ID consult request for a five-year-old um, transferred from Mount Druid with uh, it's like a, a ESBL urosepsis and there's susceptibility pat patterns here, requesting advice on duration and management. So our nice ID fellow who's in the audience came check out the patient. I've skipped the, um, the uh, investigations, but there, her impression was it's an ESBL UTI um, urosepsis um, with resolving uh, kidney damage. Um, there is evidence of fluid overload because they gave too much fluid on resuscitation. And their plan was to continue meropenem um, and to give... 7 to 10 days from the first negative blood culture and to repeat the blood culture to see whether or not it was sterilised, uh, to, to, uh, to do a renal ultras ultrasound to see if there are any collections, and to, re and to chase the um, blood culture susceptibilities from Mount Druid to see if they were the same as the urine culture that we, that we had for, um, when they were at Westmead Kids. So it was the same. Um, there was no collections. Um, the blood culture was, was, was negative. So sterilisation, and the, and the creatinine was getting better. So then I get a call from my ID fellow, hey, Tony, can we, can we send this patient on HIT? So what's the options? We've got ertapenem and, and meropenem infusers. Um, now, the thing that uh, one of the main take-home messages I, I want you guys to remember um, from paediatric practice is that kids clear ertapenem much faster than adults, and we need to give it BD versus daily. So depending on the... Uh, uh, the workload uh, assigned for our HIF service, um, they let us know whether or not they can um, accommodate BD ertapenem. So the other option is meropenem. And as um, the speakers have previ previously discussed, the massive stability issues. So let's investigate that. So we got a letter from Baxter again. Uh, reduced shelf life, four days to three days. Room temperature of six hours. Again, they started looking for stabilities and impurities, but then unlike um, keftazidine, where they reduced the shelf life specifically because of impurities, they've reduced the shelf life of meropenem of both because of the stability and the impurities. And um, I think Darren briefly mentioned that um, uh, before, the impurities that Baxter found in their stability study were these, um, these byproducts that are actually uh, produced by the body normally, and they're seen as, as non-toxic. So um, I'm surprised that no one presented this paper, because this is my favourite paper in, in regards to HIF. And if any of your authors of this paper is, is, is in the audience, I'll give you a good kudos, because um, I think this was a big game-changer in terms of my practice. Um, so it almost felt like it was three, three studies in one. They probably could have got three publications out of this. They did a stability study, a retrospective efficacy study, and a PK modelling study. Um, so in that retrospective efficacy and safety study, they showed a relatively good clinical cure rate with infrequent adverse drug reactions. Um, but their stability study, looking at a 1% uh, and 2%, or uh, I like, like it presented like this, 10 mg per mil or two, 20 mg per mil of meropenem at room temperature, their recovery rate was around 87%. So if we're following uh, United States or European targets, that's not stable. So there's a lot of talk about stability and impurities when we're, we're talking about antibiotics in here. 
And one thing that's overlooked in this discussion I think is extremely important, and I'm glad that um, Jason and, and, and your colleagues have started looking into this, is the PKPD. So what um, Manning's paper did, they, they did a population PK study of that dose at room temperature at this concentration, and they measured the plasma concentration of meropenem over you know, more than five days' worth, taking into consideration this 90 or 87% degradation. These lines here are the UCAS breakpoints for enterobacteria assay, so E. coli, Klebs, Pseudomonas, this dotted line here. And one can see that we're getting well over 100% time above MIC. And um, as well described by our mate Jace here, um, our carbon penum target is 40%. Right? So really, we've got a lot of room to move. This is 95% confidence intervals. And we're well above targets, and we because we're giving it as a continuous infusion. So let me challenge you all here: if an antibiotic continuous infusion that is not stable, so there's a loss of 90 percent or a loss of 10 percent, sorry, it still achieves PKPD targets. So despite the lack of stability, and does not have toxic degradation products, would you still prescribe it? So to really um, look into this challenge. Um, we need to see what the definition of stable is. So, um, the stability, is, as previously discussed, is, is defined as 90% by the Europeans and the US, but the UK have a much higher target of 95%. So then this begs the question, is this arbitrary? Who's picking these numbers? Why are we picking these numbers? Are they based on clinically sound evidence or patient outcome data? Um, Probably not, but to, to, really, um, to really look into this, I thought I might think outside of the box and um, look at um, drugs that, um, so not antibiotics, not infectious diseases, so what class of drugs is, is more toxic, or arguably more toxic, and arguably um, has a narrower therapeutic index than antibiotics? And I looked into chemotherapy. So this was actually referenced in the, the background of the Manning paper. Uh, but this was a, um, a, a consensus group in Europe. So they met up at this conference, all these uh, D farms from pretty much all over Europe. Um, guidelines for the practical stability studies of anti-cancer drugs, a European con uh, consensus conference. So this is what the author said. Thus, the consensus group considers that the classical and dogmatic greater than 90% reported in the majority of stability studies could be modified to 95%, 85%, or any stability um, limit depending on the drug. This is like a mic drop moment. <laughs> um, so so looking, looking back at, at, at this Manning paper, they got 87%. So if we picked 85%, you know, fine. Um, so then they have a few exceptions. However, in all cases, it is strongly recommended that the chosen stability limits must be justified and clinically relevant. In a general guideline, it is recommended that limits for drugs with low TIs, um, so they induce baromatic toxicity or neurotoxicity, st stability limits lower than 95% could be acceptable for very unstable drugs. <coughs> Keftavazine, meritum. Um, <laughs> but only in the absence of any toxic degradation products in, case, in cases of significant inter-individual variability in metabolism and activity. So look at the case of meropenem. It's a wide therapeutic index. There's a lack of interpatient variability because it's predominantly renally cleared. Um, it achieves PKPD targets despite degradation. The degradation products are not toxic limitation is, oh, this is an adult study, but we do give much lower doses and less concentrated doses in children. So I filled in a Form C. Form C, 24-hour stability, up to the Manning paper concentration, max dose 4.8 grams a day, four-day fridge stability, hung with ice packs. So that's what we did for this patient. This patient got 1.56 grams a day to finish six days. Uh, in 2008, we had five patients on continuous, continuous infusion meropenem and two patients on ertapenem. And when I was doing this presentation last week, I thought to myself, oh, we should have done TDM on these patients just to really see if we're really achieving targets. And we could have done that here just next door at St Vinnie's. Um, 
So that would just be a random level. It could be you know, uh, four to five times the MIC or at MIC, depending on which papers you follow. I think Jace is the four, by four to five times MIC group. Um, so take home messages. AMS utilization data can assist in the management and risk assessment of stability issues like in kept hazarding. The PK of vertepenem in children may limit its use because they clear it faster. We have to give a BD versus daily. The stabi stability limits are jurisdictional, so depend depending who you follow. But most importantly, one needs to justify their stability, stability limit and clinical relevance individually, taking into consideration yet stability, the impurities, whether or not they're toxic byproducts, and the PKBT and PD. And I think TDM really ties into that last point. Questions? <laughs>